Hello and welcome. My name is Kirsten Whitfield and I'm a director in Field Fisher's Privacy, Security and Information Law team. This is a webinar in Field Fisher's Get Data Protection Fit series. We're now on to module 2A of the series, putting data protection into practice. And this is segment one of the module 2A. And I'll be taking a look at how to differentiate between a controller and a processor. By the end of this webinar, you should be able to differentiate a controller from a processor and spot when an organization is both a controller and a processor. To understand the distinction between a controller and a processor, let's first take a look at the definitions for these terms in the GDPR itself. So if you first look at the top box, which is in pink, the definition for a controller is the natural or legal person, public authority, agency or other body which alone or jointly with others determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data. And if you take a look at the box underneath that in blue, we have the definition for processor. And the processor, as you'll see, is the body that processes personal data on behalf of the controller. So they're not determining the purpose and means of processing. The controller is, and the processor is doing something with the data on behalf of the controller. Now breaking that down a little further on this next slide, you'll see on the left hand side, the controller determines the purpose of processing. So they are really determining what is done with the personal data and why it's done. The processor doesn't determine any of the purposes. The controller also determines the means of processing, that's the how of the processing, and the processor doesn't determine the means. Now just on that point, um, I should flag that this is where there's often confusion because it's not really that clear cut in reality. What actually often happens is that a processor will have some degree of determining the means of processing. So let's take, for example, a software as a service provider. They may be providing a service to the controller customer and they process the data that's, that's input into their piece of software on behalf of the controller and it's for the controller's purposes. But they've designed that software and, and therefore have had some input in terms of the means for processing that personal data. Now that doesn't necessarily make them a controller. And quite often it's a matter of degree and there's no clear line here defined um, which if you cross over it, you become a controller. Now moving on to the boxes at the bottom of the slides um, and first looking at on the controller side, the controller determines processing either alone or jointly with other controllers. So it can be what is referred to as a sole controller on its own, or it could be a controller jointly with other controllers. By contrast, the processor is acting under the instructions of the sole or joint controllers. So this is the section of the GDPR definition which referred to the processor processing personal data on behalf of the controller. In practice, what that translates into is that they're acting under their instruction. Now, when trying to distinguish controllers from processors, there are three key questions that are helpful. The first one is, why is the processing taking place? So why, why is this happening? That will lead you to, hopefully, the purposes of processing. And then from that, you can look at whose purposes are they? Another question is, who initiated it? 
more often than not, the party that initiated the processing will be the controller. And thirdly, what level of autonomy do the parties have over the processing of the data? A controller will have autonomy over the processing of information. A processor will either have no autonomy over it or very little autonomy. Now, if we roll that all into one, the really big question is, who calls the shots? Now, what actually happens in reality quite often is that personal data is used for multiple purposes, and in which case, you'd need to take a look at each purpose and determine who's the controller and who's the processor for each of those purposes. And you could find that an entity is a processor for one purpose, but a controller for another purpose. Now, to put that concept into context, I'm going to take an example of a software as a service provider. And their solution is one for employees of their customers to input their expense claims. Now, starting with the first purpose, which is the one along the top, here we have the service provider monitoring how many end users, that's the employees of the customer, are using their solution, and then comparing that to the license terms that have been issued. So how many licenses have been issued, and is the customer staying within those licenses? Now, that is a purpose of the providers. So they're calling the shots here, not the customer. So in this case, it's the provider that would be the controller. Now, moving on to the next one, on the left-hand side and looking a box down, we have the employees inputting data because they're claiming their expense claims, so they're inputting information for that. Now, that information is being collected and, and um, used for the customer's purposes. This is part of the service that the provider is providing to the customer. This is not the provider's purpose. This is the customer's purpose. So here, the customer is the controller, and the provider, who is only using the data under the customer's instructions would be the processor. Now, as it turns out, the provider is also aggregating data to identify ways that they can improve their services for all of their customers. So it's a general service improvement purpose. And that's the provider's purpose for using the data in an aggregated form. So even if here they're anonymizing it, um, because they have to do some processing on the data to anonymize it, the provider is still processing data in some way, shape, or form here. And this is, again, a service provider's purpose. So this is not being done at the behest of the customer. This is being done because the provider wants to do this to improve services to all of its customers. In this case, the provider is a controller. Now, looking to the box on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, we also have um, a functionality within this solution that's provided where some monitoring takes place. And that monitoring is to try to detect when there's errors, say you might have a duplicated expense claim by accident, or even if there's um, potential fraud that might be taking place. So this is part of the service that's provided to the customer, um, and it does involve processing personal data because it's, it's monitoring what's being input and by who it's being input. But as it's part of the service that's provided, and this will be done under the instructions of the customer, i.e. Um, in accordance with the service terms, this is a customer purpose. This is not the service provider's purpose for use of the data. So in this case, the service provider will be the processor. And it's the customer here that will be the controller. <laughs> 
Now finally, if we look to the bottom right hand corner, there's a, there's a final use of the data, which is the provider is using the email addresses um, that are within the solution for employees to send the employees marketing and promote their goods and services. Now again, this is a provider purpose. So this is not done on behalf of the customer. This is what the provider wants to do to promote their own goods and services. So in this case, the provider is the controller. So what does that mean for your contracts? Well, if you have a controller to process a relationship only, um, then the contract terms that you'll want to make sure are in there are the Article 28 processor clauses. So that's the GDPR, Article 28 lists a host of things that you need to reflect in your agreements with processors. If it's a controller to controller agreement, then you would most likely want to acknowledge that relationship. So that you, it's not controller to processor, it's controller to controller. And you might want to add any other desired restrictions or requirements around data usage. So those are not specifically dictated by the GDPR. So that would be a matter of commercial relationship. Now the caveat here to watch out for is if the parties are joint controllers. So joint controllers jointly determine the purposes of processing and means of processing. That's as opposed to a sole controller. So you could have multiple sole controllers, each doing things with the data for their own purposes, or you could have joint controllers that have a joint purpose and joint means uh, for processing personal data. Now, if the parties are joint controllers, then the GDPR does actually impose some requirements in terms of what should be agreed between the parties. And you have to set out in your agreement the respective responsibilities of each of the com parties for compliance with the GDPR. Now, what if you have this situation where there's multiple uses of personal data for different purposes? And for some, the, the parties may be controllers, and for others, they might be processors. So how that translates into your contract is that you may well need to incorporate elements of both of the above. So Article 28 clauses um, plus the controller to controller provisions that you would need to include, either sole controller provisions or joint controller provisions. And the key here is being really clear about when which terms will apply. So that will involve listing the various purposes of processing and the personal data and identifying for each which set of terms will apply. It's not always clear cut, but having listened to this webinar, you should hopefully now be more confident about differentiating controllers from processors and also be able to spot when an organization is both a controller and a processor. You've now completed the first segment of Module 2A, Putting Data Protection into Practice. And you'll see here on the slide, there are four more segments in this module to come. So please do look out for those. If you have any questions, please do feel free to get in contact with me. You'll see here on this slide my contact details. And there's also information on this slide on other places you can find some useful information. So uh, you can look at our YouTube channel where you'll find other sessions that we've recorded. You could look at the ICO's website, which also contains a host of useful information. Field Fisher has a privacy blog, which is always full of very useful and practical articles, so it's definitely worth subscribing to. And um, the Field Fisher privacy team have also um, published a GDPR app, which is super helpful. 
and um, it's available in Apple and Android and it's free of charge so please do download it. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.